Okay. Oh, good entrance here too. Kevin, can you unmute Andrew also? Sure, give me one second. And a prompt on your screen. Hey everyone. Right. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, quick We're question. We're going to wait another five minutes because I'm, I'm. I think many more people signed up. And uh... great. Um, just, just a quick question while sure. we we wait for others. Um, Allison and I um, have a, a a PowerPoint. I don't know if we're able to share our screen or if we should could send it to you. Um, um, not me, Kevin or Will. Can yeah, should it be you, Andrew, or Allison, or both of you? When you're I'm, ready, um, I can give you the permission. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, let's see what Rebecca is saying. Okay, uh, Rebecca's going to call him by phone until she gets home and then she'll call him. Calling when Are you zooming in? you see a lot more people coming on or you, can you tell? We have, we have 20 people. 
Okay, so we're going to wait a few more minutes then. Oh. Maybe in a minute or two, Kevin, you'll give the opening speech and then hopefully Rebecca will be on by then. And Bob, I'm on. I'm just on myself. Hi. Hi. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and just really quickly, while we wait for a couple other folks to join, though, now that all three co-chairs are here, maybe we should get going. Yeah. Mina White from the BP's office has her hand up. Mina, did you have like a quick question or comment before we start? Um, I, well, I just wanted to know if I could give like an announcement. Or, if like, you what? Kind of, if I can give like an office announcement. Sure. At the top of the meeting or if I should do it at the end. Is it my computer or is it, are we having a tough time hearing? Yeah, can Mina. You it is a little hard to hear you. I um, think I think you can give your announcement now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you all. Okay. Hello, um, Chair Barbara, uh, Chair Wilma, and Chair Rebecca. Hello. How are you? Um, <laughs> uh, thank you all for um, allowing me to just speak and give a brief announcement. One, I do want to say that um, the office of uh, Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine is hosting his Women's Her Story Month. Uh, event tomorrow at um, Hunter College's Roosevelt House. Um, that will be at 6 p.m. And so we are honoring heroines in health and wellness. So for those on the call, for those listening, uh, we hope that you will join us um, tomorrow, just honoring women um, in the health field and also the domestic violence realm um, who are focusing on, of course, people in general, but uh, specifically also focusing on um, women care and uh, the health and wellness of women in general. Um, so again, that'll be at the Roosevelt, um, the Roosevelt House 47-49 uh, East 65th Street. Um, so doors open at 5.30 and the event starts at six, um, ends around eight. Um, our second announcement I just wanna give is that we did extend community board applications. So if there's anyone on the call right now, if there's anyone listening um, to the recording as it's live, uh, and if you have an interest in applying to community board eight or any other community boards in Manhattan, we just ask that um, you submit your application and you have until March 31st at 5 p.m. Um, so I just wanted to give those two updates and um, thank you for the meeting and excited to listen in. Thanks, Nina. Thank you. Thank you all Love so it much. Dave and heard what's going on. But maybe give us some ideas of what the borough president's doing too, but thank you. Uh, Kevin? Do you want to get started and tell the rules of the of the road? Sure. Let me just pull it up. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. If this is your first time joining us, everyone will remain muted throughout the meeting, except for um, Barbara, Rebe Rebecca, and Wilma, and the presenters, Allison and Andrew. Following the presentations, the co-chairs will call on members of the public wishing to speak. You can participate by going to the reactions icon, ra pressing raise hand, not the wave or thumbs up. Only press it once. If you press it a second time, your hand will go back down. If you are on the phone, it is star nine to raise hand and star six to unmute. Be on the lookout for a prompt asking you to confirm unmuting once the co-chairs call on you. The chat is for technical support only to help with Zoom software problems, not to ask questions of the coach. They will not the chats. If you have an older version of Zoom, you will need to go to the participants section where you will find the raise hand feature there. Please do not raise your actual hand or wave at the screen because we may not be able to see you. Chat me, I'm here for support. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, as always. Uh, I think I'll get started. Uh, I'm Barbara Rudder and there's Rebecca Dangor and uh, Wilma Johnson. We're co-chairs of this committee. We, uh, we have been talking about different aspects of health that has been difficult. Uh, in our community, whether it's Medicare or or, uh, 
or the, the care in the different hospitals and so on. The one thing that has come up was the price of drugs. I had three people in two weeks talking about a specific drug that is costing hundreds of dollars a month. We have a new congressperson representing us, although not a new congressperson, Jerry Nadler. And we're so pleased that his office has agreed to come and discuss what legislation there is. So we welcome Allison Cohn and Andrew, I hope I pronounce your name right, Heinemann, is that right? I hope that's right. And they're going to talk about all aspects of what's going on in Congress that deals with, I guess, maybe health generally, but specifically the price of drugs. And I think there'll be some active questions after. So after they're finished with the presentation, we're going to be asking um, the, first the public and then the community board people to uh, weigh in with any questions and problems they have and so on. So. Um, Allison and Andrew, and would you mind telling exactly uh, where you fit into the uh, congressman's office, what your positions are? Yeah, sure. I can I can start. Um, I'm Andrew Heineman. Um, you, I pronounced it right. You pronounced it right. And even if you hadn't, uh, people pronounce it all different ways. And I, I don't really care that that much, to be honest. Um, I'm the congressman's legislative director, uh, which means I, I oversee all uh, policy. Um, I work in his Washington, D.C. office. Um, and uh, while I don't handle health care uh, directly, um, I, I essentially uh, oversee the congressman's policy uh, priorities and uh, work closely with with Allison Cohen, who will speak next, who, who does uh, who does lead our efforts on health care. Hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. I'm Allison Cohen. And like Andrew said, I cover health policy for the congressman. Great. Do you want to, whoever wants to start? And sure. Uh, you. Kevin, did you give uh, me? Yeah, you did. Ability to share screen. I'm going to share a presentation. want to take it away, Andrew. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we are excited to now uh, represent the east side. Um, let me just say that it was very unfortunate that redistricting happened. Um, we worked very closely with Carol Maloney's office, especially at the staff level. Um, you know, I, I was I was pretty devastated for some of my friends in the office, but thankfully, uh, they all landed on their feet and I worked hard to ensure uh, that they would all find uh, jobs in new offices. So, you know, despite despite uh, them having to go against each other in, in the primary, um, our offices worked closely together throughout the primary and afterwards. And, uh, you know, they they gave us a very good um you know, sort of exit briefing on uh, community priorities. And so we're now happy to be, you know, meeting you um, now on Zoom, hopefully in, in the future in person uh, so that we can, you know, start, uh, you know, serving you to the best of our abilities. Uh, so uh, we were asked to come to speak about um, prescription drug pricing and a number of other issues uh, related to healthcare and, and seniors and, and uh, happy to expand on that as well. And so uh, just to kick off the agenda, we wanted to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a large reconciliation um, bill that was signed into law by President Biden last Congress. We also wanted to talk about President Biden's budget, which was unveiled earlier yes. this month. Uh, we are now currently in the appropriations process uh, and so we are now working to support uh, many aspects of the president's budget, and uh, that appropriations process will likely last throughout the year. Um, and the uh, deadline, the essentially the uh, previous appropriations bill funds the government until September uh, 30th. So with this new president's budget, we are looking to um, fund the government and hopefully change things for the better uh, after September 30th. We also wanted to touch on uh, Congressman Nadler's sponsored and co-sponsored bills. Now we are not uh, Congressman Nadler is not on a 
on one of the main two committees of jurisdiction for healthcare issues. Those two committees are the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. However, the Judiciary Committee uh, still works on some things related to drug pricing, and we do, our, we do our best to be supportive of other legislation outside of the Judiciary Committee. Um, because the ranking member or chair job of the Judiciary Committee is such a big job, they do not allow that person to be on other committees. Um, and so he is he is only on judiciary. But again, we we work very hard to um, support uh, health care policy and policy related to seniors and in, in across other committees. Uh, we then wanted to touch on um, what you can do as as a community board, as, as advocates, and then open it up to uh, question and answers. Thank you. Great. Um, so uh, if you recall, we originally had a bill called the Build Back Better Act, and uh, that bill passed the House. Unfortunately, we could not get support. Um, we could not get 50 votes in the Senate, and it sort of fell apart for a while and disappeared, and we were worried that it just wasn't going to happen. Um, and then it ended up coming back after Senator Manchin had an agreement with Senator Schumer and President Biden. And while the uh, bill wasn't perfect, um, we are pleased that it got a number of uh, a number of provisions related to uh, reducing the price of prescription drugs. And so just to go through them uh, one by one, the IRA requires the federal government to negotiate prices for some top selling drugs covered under Medicare. And so uh, this is not going to be covering every drug, but it's a huge, a huge improvement. The, uh, you know, pharma industry was very opposed to, to this um, and it will end up making a large number of, of prescription drugs cheaper. And uh, there's room for, I believe, to expand this program over, over time. Um, it also requires drug companies to pay rebates if prices rise faster than inflation for drugs used by Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and so uh, we are having awful, awful, awful issues with inflation right now. So this is another provision designed to help uh, consumers um, bring down uh, you know, drug, drug prices. The bill also eliminates a 5% co-insurance pay for catastrophic coverage in Medicare Part D in 2024, adds a $2,000 cap on Part D out-of-pocket spending in 2025, and limits annual increases in Part D premiums for 2024 to 2030. On the next slide, we'll show you a little bit more about the time frame. Now, it would have been wonderful if these things could have happened right away. There's a lot of restrictions for doing uh, the bill through reconciliation. Reconciliation means that we can pass a bill with only a majority vote in the Senate. And we had to do that because last, last Congress, it was a 50-50 Senate. And we had, we would have, in order to pass something outside of reconciliation, uh, we would have require 10 Republicans to vote for it. Uh, that proved very difficult. Um, I led the Respect for Marriage Act, which codified uh, same-sex marriage and interracial marriage in at the federal level. And it was incredibly difficult to get 10, 10 Republicans for that. It took months and months and months of negotiation. We ended up getting 13, but sadly we couldn't get anywhere near that number uh, for, for this type of of legislation. And so in order to pass it through reconciliation, there were a lot of budgetary concerns that uh, restricted restricted us. And so that is part of the reason why uh, there are delays in things going into effect. There are other reasons as well. Um, and it's also sometimes part of the reason why the bill didn't go quite as far as, as we would have liked it to go. Um, and so, uh, it, the bill also limits monthly cost sharing for insulin products to $35 for people with Medicare. Now, this is very positive. Um, you know, we want to very much support uh, people that are on Medicare. The original Build Back Better 
uh, bill that that passed the House and that Congressman Nadler co-sponsored and, and voted for in the House uh, did not just stop at Medicare. It also uh, included private insurance. And that is something we are going to be pushing for very hard. Unfortunately, we could not get 50 senators to support that. We were very, very, very frustrated. We could not get any Republicans to support it. We were also frustrated about that. Um, and so we, we ended up just uh, doing Medicare beneficiaries for that, but we are very much hoping to expand it in the future. The RRA also expands eligibility for Medicare Part D low-income subsidy benefits. Um, you know, this will very much uh, help uh, low-income individuals with uh, their health insurance costs. Um, the bill eliminates cost sharing for adult vaccines covered under Medicare Part D and improves access to adult vaccines under Medicaid and CHIP. Um, so thankfully, there was a lot of programs that uh, made vaccines free for COVID, for MPOX, for other things, but uh, this will dramatically make anything that's not covered by a larger program cheaper, which is great. So the original Build Back Better Act completely repealed this, but uh, the IRA further delays the implementation of the Trump administration's drug rebate rule, which uh, a lot of Democrats feel will actually harm consumers uh, and, and increase the price of uh, prescription drugs. Um, Allison, do you have anything to add? You covered it, Andrew. Okay, we great. Uh, so the next slide, I'll, you know, I just, I won't, you know, go through this all, but uh, we, we can share these slides. I, I believe maybe they were already shared. If not, we'll share them uh, as well. But um, we just sort of wanted to show you uh, what this looks like over time. Uh, it is very confusing, but, um, you know, again, this is the very, very best that we could do in the Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, we are still very happy that this ended up getting across the finish line for, for months and months. It looked like uh, this was not going to happen. As someone who covers um, climate change uh, and also climate resiliency for Congressman Nadler, uh, we are also happy that this bill makes the largest uh, investment in uh, uh, addressing the climate crisis in, in history. And so, you know, we are you know, very happy that this bill got across the finish line. We just like would have liked for it to be much closer to the Build Back Better bill uh, that the, the House passed. Um, so this shows you by 2029, this will have all gone into effect, but a lot of the a lot of the really important provisions go into effect by 2025. So in the next two years. All right. So now we're into the president's budget. Now I want to say first that the president's budget is is really a request to Congress. And so uh, it is not um, a given that Congress will end up passing an appropriations bill that includes these proposals. However, uh, we are gonna try our very best. Um, at the very least, we are gonna hold the line on, on healthcare funding in, in the House and hopefully expand on it in the Senate. Uh, but we are gonna work very hard in appropriations uh, to, to make this all happen. So uh, the pre President Biden's budget uh, proposes expanding Medicare's ability to negotiate drug prices, uh, sort of further, uh, you know, improving on what we did with the IRA. Uh, it expands the IRA's requirement that drug companies pay rebates when they increase prices faster than inflation. This is very, very important. Um, you know, drug prices were already out of are already out of control, but with inflation, they're becoming even worse. Um, you know, it's unfortunately been that way my whole life. I'm from Los Angeles, and and even people that were not, you know, struggling that much financially would would drive all the way from Los Angeles and cross the border into Tijuana just to get cheaper prescription drugs because they are so unbelievably expensive in the United States. And so um, inflation obviously makes that worse. And, and this would, um, you know, ensure that uh, the drugs are um, cheaper, uh, do, you know, under, under this terrible inflation that we're having. Uh, the president's proposal also strengthens the Medicaid drug rebate program, uh, which is very important for, for uh, lowering the price of drugs. 
And then it extends the Medicare solvency by 25 years or more by modestly increasing the Medicare tax rate on income above $400,000. And so um, we, we very much want to strengthen Medicare. There have been talks uh, from some Republicans uh, that they want to use the debt ceiling as an opportunity to weaken Medicare, Medicaid, and possibly Social Security. We, we hope that Medicare and Medicaid are, I'm sorry, excuse me, Medicare and um, Social Security are now off the table. Uh, however, we're still worried about Medicaid and trying to hold the line there. But regardless of that, um, we really want to ensure that Medicare is strong over the next 25 years. And so, uh, you know, the president's budget supports a small uh, tax increase for people making under individuals making under $400,000 a year to keep Medicare uh, strong. Finally, uh, the budget caps Part D cost sharing on certain generic drugs, such as those used to treat chronic, chronic conditions, to $2 per prescription per month. And so the IRA um, took the IRA covered insulin for Medicare, and then it and then um, for people under Part D, it covered certain uh, drugs. They basically looked at the uh, drugs that are um, prescribed the most that the most people depend on and, and started there. And this would uh, um, put cost sharing on certain generic drugs, which will, you know, make prescription drugs significantly cheaper. And as you see, any, anything that was covered there would only be $2 per, per prescription per month. So that would be an incredibly positive development at a time of very high drug prices. All right. Um, so we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Congressman Nadler is a ranking member of the Judiciary Committee and not on one of the main committees of jurisdiction. However, um, we have tried to be a big leader on, on this issue. Uh, Congressman Nadler uh, introduced the Prescription Pricing for the People Act of 2019, which uh, was really sort of um, putting a marker down for where we want a bill like the Build Back Better bill and later the IRA bill to, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that uh, we, these bills that were going to pass the House were as, as, you know, strong as possible in terms of uh, you know, decreasing the price of prescription drugs. And so the prescription pricing for the People Act was an important marker bill to uh, push the caucus in that direction. And I, I think that was successful. Uh, we also have a judiciary bill that we will be introducing again, this Congress called the Preserve Access to Affordable Generics and Biosimilars Act. Uh, this will make, as the bill says, generics and biosimilars uh, cheaper if it, if it is signed into law. Um, and then this is not listed, but uh, antitrust issues, antitrust is, is handled by the Judiciary Committee. And so if there are, are ever, uh, you know, mergers or other uh, intellectual property disputes that uh, could potentially, um, you know, increase the cost of prescription drugs for consumers, that is in the committee's jurisdiction and we work closely on, on that. Um, we do a lot of antitrust stuff that, that deals with the drug companies, just a lot of it is not um, handled through legislation. Uh, it's, it's handled through working closely with the Department of Justice of, often. Um, and then we are the co-sponsor, Congressman Nadler is the co-sponsor, it has not been reintroduced as Congress, of the Medicare Negotiation and Competitive Licensing Act. Uh, this is a bill introduced by the uh, Democratic leader on the Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, which has the primary jurisdiction over Medicare. And uh, this is about as, as, as uh, you know, good of a bill as, as there is uh, in terms of decreasing um, healthcare costs. And so we are a strong supporter of this bill so that, uh, you know, hopefully the Rep Democrats will take control of the House again in, in, uh, in 2024, um, and uh, you know we will have a chance to pass another bill, and if if that is the case, um, we very much want uh, it to look like the Medicare Negotiation and Competitive Licensing Act, uh, and we believe it will dra dramatically decrease healthcare costs. 
And so uh, we we show a support for that bill and it's hopefully gonna be introduced uh, in the near future. Great, um, so the next section is uh, talking about what you can do. So uh, we very much encourage you to share your stories and, and reach out to your representatives and senators. So I, I believe for most of you, uh, we Congressman Nadler is your, is your uh, representative. And then you also have Senators Schumer and Gillibrand. Now, for the most part, uh, your, your members in New York likely agree with you on this issue. Um, and so while it is good for you to outreach to other offices, if you ever have time, a lot of times congressional offices really only take um, record comments uh, from their constituents. And so that's why we always say to encourage uh, friends and family that might have different members of Congress to reach out to their members of Congress. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of New York outside of New York City is now represented by Republicans in, in the House. Uh, there, are, there are several new Republicans uh, representing Long Island and Hudson Valley. And so, uh, you know, we very much support if, if you have friends or family that live in those areas or around the country in general, support them reaching out to their member, even if it's just to share your story, uh, your concerns, uh, you know, as their friend or family member. And uh, we cannot ethically tell you uh, to uh, join a particular advocacy group or work with a particular, particular advocacy group. But generally speaking, a lot of the advocacy groups uh, that, you know, engage with Congress on um, Prescription drug pricing, Medicare, healthcare costs in general, uh, do do really great work, and uh, we we meet with these groups often, and uh, we typically will have uh, meetings, especially during this appropriations period. We will have meetings often with constituents. In fact, Allison and I have been doing that almost nonstop for the past month, um, and it is very helpful to to hear firsthand, uh, you know, fr from people. Um, and this also, uh, you know, they do other great work in terms of trying to sort of expand the coalition of members of Congress who are, are on the side of the uh, people and the consumers on this issue instead of the side of, of pharma, I would say. All right, so that uh, pretty much takes us to the end of, of the, you know, the, the introduction that we wanted to make before we turn it over to questions. Um, I can't promise that Allison and I will know the answer to every question, but we will do our very best. And if we don't know the answer to any question, to the best of our ability, uh, we will uh, figure it out and, and respond back to you via email or, or a, another preferred method. Thank you. And can I just I ask a very basic question? One of the sure. last things you talked about was the Medicare Negotiation Act, and you said that should lower health costs. Do you mean just drugs or do you mean health costs generally? I would say health costs generally. Um, now, one issue is that uh, we need Medicare to be a lot stronger because a lot of doctors yeah. have stopped taking Medicare. Oh, we do know that in this Oh, area. yes. Um, it is very hard to find as I'm preaching to the choir. I have this problem myself. Uh, it is very hard to find, especially mental health um, treatment Internist that is covered by Medicare. Possible. And, and so we don't, we very much want to lower prescription drugs. We very much want to lower it. Uh, they are far too high. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's an issue now with a prostate cancer drug that is so expensive and, and so, uh, you know, uh, there's so little of it that people are having to go months without prostate cancer treatment. And it's just, it's just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And so we do very much care about prescription drugs, but we're constantly talking about uh, strengthening Medicare and so, so that uh, people on Medicare uh, have less out-of-pocket costs and have more of their uh, costs being covered because more health professionals are taking Medicare. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rebecca, do you want to ask questions? Does anybody have their hands up? Well, is that... Is Alex Adver on? I don't, I can't see. Is, did he get on? Yeah. Oh, can we start with Alex? Because I know he spent a lot of time with me discussing. 
We unmute Alex. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Also, um, Allison, we could probably stop sharing the screen as, as well now. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, uh, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to see this happening. Uh, much more is needed, uh, but this is a good start. Um, Barbara uh, and I have talked about the cost of drugs uh, off and on for quite a while now. And the last time I went to get Eliquis, which is pretty common drug for people my age, um, which, which is, is a blood thinner. Right. Sorry? I said it's 25 is your age. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of. The, uh, the, um, I, was, I was absolutely appalled that my uh, usual 90-day prescription cost me $728. Now, I have all kinds of insurance. I'm, I'm on Medicare. I have supplemental. I have PDP program. The whole works. Uh, it was $728. And I said, well, are there any coupons to lower the price? And the nice, sweet young thing said, oh, gosh, if it, with a coupon, it costs two or three times more. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I have this kind of a impression when I go into a drugstore, it's almost like going into a car dealership. You look at the different cars. You pick out the one you like, you sign on the dotted line, and then you know what the price is going to be. And it's too late at that point. You've already agreed to buy the car, whatever the price would have been. That's kind of like how I feel about drugs uh, pricing. Every time I go into the drugstore, I never know what it's going to cost me to get Thalicus. I, uh, I, I, I did a little homework. I went back about 180 weeks, 160 weeks, and I just tallied up what was I paying for those 90-day prescriptions. And I saw that there was an upward trend, not surprisingly, that amounted to about 42% increase over the last three years. 42% per year. Not, not not over the whole period of time. Then I went to a website that said, get your drugs in Canada. And I thought, well, that could be an interesting thing to look into. I looked at uh, the price of drugs. And weirdly enough, Eliquis, which is off patent since last month, is available um, slightly cheaper as a brand name in Canada than the generic brand of Eliquis. And they, uh, on the average, the 90-day thing in Canada is $177. And when I pay $728, it just makes me fuming mad. What can I do about it? You know, the alternative is a cheap drug called warfarin. Anybody who's been on warfarin, that's rat poison, by the way. Anybody who's been on warfarin realizes it's a real hassle to use it. You have to go in for testing every 30 days. And if you travel abroad, you have to be really careful about what vegetables you consume. Um, it, it's really complicated, but it's a cheap drug. Um, something needs to be done about the cost, the pricing of drugs, because I'm, I'm a retired chemistry professor. So I understand chemistry reasonably well. And I'm also a retired um, pharmaceutical researcher. So I understand the industry a little bit well too. And my impression is that the prices are high because they can get away with it. That's what they can, that's what the market would tolerate. And there's no alternatives to these drugs. If you look at the three top blood thinners, they all have similar prices to Eliquis. And I figure, well, if I were the competitors to Eliquis, I'd pick the same price. Hey, that's a winning price. Wall Street would love the 18% operational profit margins. And I'll just price mine $10 less, you know, just to be competitive on a lower price basis. They're all around five, $600 for a 90-day uh, prescription. So that's kind of like where I am. Yeah. If you look at coupons, if you're not insured, 
If you look at coupons in, in for the several most popular drugs, about fifteen hundred dollars for a three month supply without any insurance. That's a lot, especially if you're not insured. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for sharing that story. Yeah. Just, to, just to respond very quickly, um, you know, I understand uh, sadly some of that firsthand. I was I was uninsured for several years before the the ACA, um, and my parents still go to uh, Mexico to get lots of their drugs, despite having basically the best insurance insurance money can buy, because uh, in Mexico they can get the non generic cheaper far cheaper than they can get the generic in the united states with again the best yeah. insurance they could possibly have now now one thing to to share that is a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel although i know it's you know not nearly enough is that that drug rebate uh program that i mentioned earlier in the ira uh only that that is basically um supposed to uh incentivize drug companies from raising the cost of their drugs uh, too too much, um, and so that actually went into effect uh, starting January first of of this year, and uh, that program gets stronger and stronger and stronger until two thousand twenty five. So, uh, the president's budget also wants to uh, proposes strengthening that program. So it is my hope that since that program went into effect less than uh, sorry about a little over three three months ago, uh, it is my hope that we do start to see uh, uh, drunk companies being more careful about uh, raising prices like this, uh, because they are going to be heavily uh, penalized for it. Um, and so uh, we are going to work very hard to strengthen that. But it is nice that there is one light at the end of the tunnel that that just started going into effect um, January 1st. And it looks like April 1st, um, uh, there's going to be another another uh, wave of, of improvement on this issue because uh, Medicare will be able to, um, people get essentially lower coinsurance for certain drugs if the price increased faster than the rate of inflation in, in any given quarter. So that means uh, starting even April 1st, uh, that, sh that program should be its next step. And so hopefully people start seeing um, decreased prices uh, starting sometime after April and uh, that continue to get uh, you know, stronger uh, up until December 2025. I'm just going to say the reason I even thought about a committee with my committee um, chairs is because I first, a good friend of mine just recently had to go on blood thinner and she told me the story. About three days later, I met Alex and he told me the story. And about five days after that, another friend of mine who had a blood clot is on blood thinner had been getting it as samples from the doctor. The doctor ran out of samples and couldn't believe how much he had to pay. So within about a week and a half, I had three of my friends we're all on Medicare and three of my friends that had exactly the same story within a few dollars. So it's um, pretty sad. And these are people that luckily, you know, were not poor, but this is a lot of money with, for one drug. And most of the time you need more than one drug along the way. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely not acceptable. And, you know, so many people are not getting the medication they need because they can't afford it or right. it's, or it's, just such a terrible financial burden for those that can't afford it. Yeah, and blood thinner is something that, it, you know, yeah. mild painkiller is something. Rebecca, are there other people you, you should call on? Is Rebecca on? Hey, Meryl has her hand up. Great, oh, thanks. but Erica also does. Sorry, let's go to Erica first because she's a member right. of the public. Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. And Valerie, I look forward to connecting with you. Uh, um, so I know it's being recorded, but if for any of for any journalists who might be on the line, this is off the record. Um, a per, um, Professor Avdi, um, I've worked in pharma for th nearly 30 years now. Um, so, and, and I'm very familiar with um, Eloquis. Um, I also live with multiple sclerosis. 
the medicine that I started taking that I continue to be on for the last 14 years started off at around $26,000 retail. It is now at 88,000 retail. Now, I certainly don't pay the retail amount. <laughs> um, however, it's a 27-year-old drug. Nothing has changed about that drug in this time period. I mean, I won't say nothing. They went. It went from being leothalized, which is a powder form, to an auto injector. So they did do some investment along the way. So one of one of this and there's all as as Andrew as you know there's a downstream and an upstream when we see buybacks stock buybacks to the tune of billions of dollars every you know several times a year from these companies and then they say that most of the money goes into research and development those two messages do not align In addition to that, we are only one of two countries that allows direct-to-consumer advertising for medicines. I have no problem with it online or in magazines because people are actively going to seek it out there. But right now, New Zealand and the United States are the only two countries that allow TV commercials because it falls under First Amendment because of Citizens United. So I love that these things are happening right now because again, this is this has been my career. And I, I'm not gonna sit here and bash pharma because they have done a lot of good things for people. You know, some drugs have been homegrown in the pharmaceutical industry. Others have come up through the NIH and academic institutions, and that's a whole other conversation to be had. However, when 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 Professor Avdeev says he can get his medicines cheaper in Canada, it's because that since the dawn of time, the United States has subsidized research and development for the rest of the world. So I realized that like the wheels of justice, the wheels of legislation move at a, at a glacial mastodon way. However, People are dying waiting, literally dying waiting. And I won't even get into how many times I have had to beg a pharmacy benefit management company to send me my medication for the MS. And I'm sure you've heard this a million and 12 times. I've already sent you and Allison an email if you want to talk to me because I am a unicorn. I work in the industry and I live with two chronic diseases. So I am an active user and I also am a single person LLC. I own my own business. So I'm on the ACA in New York state, which is not affordable. I don't qualify for subsidies and that's fine. I'm glad that there are people who do because that's the kind of liberal Democrat I am. But I, I, I know, and, and I, lived in Jerry, I lived in Jerry Nadler's district on the Upper West Side and then I moved to the Upper East Side two plus years ago. So... I love that there is some forward motion, but all the things that are connected to the fact that this has not also been taken up in the private sector insurance, that needs to change. Because as a single person LLC, who's, who has, you know, a good, who has, depending upon what age range, what age it is at that point. I'm 53, so I'm a ways off from Medicare. I am bearing the brunt and do not qualify for things, even living with two, two disease, two significant diseases. Mm. I, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. We, we, you know, I, I'd like to understand what, um, Rep Nadler and the co-sponsors of this are are doing to move that needle. I understand that you know we don't have sixty in the Senate, but I also know that there are ways around that. Yeah, so you brought up a number of really good points, and I really appreciate you sharing your story uh, as far as connecting 
Um, you sound like a great person for us to connect with. Uh, you know, once we are through the appropriations process on April 1st, I, I would love to connect. Um, just a couple, just to touch on a couple of things you mentioned. Um, you mentioned stock buybacks. That's something I work on personally. Uh, we are very opposed to them. We're on several bills, and we work very close. We work very closely um, in in Congress, and we're working very closely uh, with the administration uh, to discourage them at the administration level and uh, dramatically um, regulate them in, in Congress. Uh, we are also. <laughs> I know this is a long shot, but we are uh, working to uh, make it so pharma cannot advertise on TV. I know that's a very minor thing that you mentioned, but just wanted to throw that out there. It's uh, not minor. It's a $10 billion a year industry. I, sorry, I just meant that it was only one small part of, of yeah. the larger things that you brought up. Not, not that it wasn't a big financial. Um, uh, there are ways that this can happen where innovation and research and development won't be grossly impacted. And I know that to be a fact. Um, as someone who worked very, very, very closely on the uh, reconciliation negotiation, uh, we were heartbroken that, uh, you know, private insurance was removed from some of the benefits. Uh, we did everything we could to stop it other than vote against the IRA. Uh, we very much needed to vote yes, given the extremely small a Democratic majority in the House last Congress, uh, but we are pushing very hard uh, to, um, you know, get get buy in from any Democrats who weren't fully on board, um, especially in the Senate, so that the you know the second we have the House again, which is hopefully in in less than two years, uh, we can uh, we can pass a, a stronger bill. Now, what we're doing in the meantime. In addition to to working to uh, go our coalition in, in Congress, is we're pushing the administration very, very, very hard uh, on this, and seeing if there are any ways we can improve things through executive action. I think that's really over the next two years going to have to, you know, be where we we make our strongest pushes. And so we, whether it's CMS or HHS, like the the agencies that that handle this stuff. We are in constant communication uh, with them. We work very closely with the Ways and Means um, uh, Subcommittee on Health, who oversees this stuff. Um, they, thankfully, are very aligned with, with what we believe, and the Democrats on the committee are very aligned with what you're bringing up. There, there needs to be a way to innovate and not completely screw um, excuse me and not completely harm the the the, the you know American no people. I agree and, yeah. and there is and the fact that they say that there isn't if these things happen is just simply not true yes I I, I very much hope that pharma lobbyists uh change their tune slightly on that I'm not lumping you in with them in, in any way I'm not um, a lobbyist no I know I know I know but uh, I I think from the go from from meeting with them firsthand last Congress it very much seemed like what the NRA does, which they oppose everything. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it really like makes no sense because they can't actually probably get to a place where the American people don't despise them if they would just sort of like meet us halfway a little bit. But we're hoping that now that the IRA is in effect and that um, these provisions are our law, that uh, they can sort of start to meet us halfway in negotiations. Um, and and my, my hope is that we could even get some moderate Republicans on board with this stuff, because a lot of them talk about how they do want cheaper prescription drugs. We just need them to uh, vote that way. Well, so many campaign on it and then yep. don't, right. don't, don't actually vote for it. Thank you, Thank Eric. You. Uh, Rebecca? Who's, oh, Meryl is next? Yeah, Meryl's next. Hi there. Um, I have a question. Um, it's my uh, observation uh, from being an old timer and having seen many presidential administrations with uh, all kinds of attempted solutions at lowering uh, drug and physician prices. Um, and also, uh, not accepting doctors who don't accept assignment because, you know, the Medicare rates are not high enough doing something about 
all of these problems is the medical malpractice rates. In the whole arena of pharmaceuticals, it's almost impossible to introduce an experimental drug that might cure somebody's cancer because somebody, some trial lawyer is going to sue them, which means the pharmaceutical companies have to have higher prices. So true of physicians, uh, certain uh, OBGYN physicians and uh, say neurosurgical, which is the rate of success is very small, uh, um, brain cancer and so forth, they are sued astronomically so that the trial lawyers have a heyday, but it drives up the prices of the, the cost of the goods and the services provided, uh, the operations, the treatments, the procedures, the intake, the outtake, et cetera, et cetera, and the cost of follow-up drug uh, medication. So has anything been done about trial lawyers who use these things, who, who inadvertently have made an industry and are very, very hard and strong lobbyists of keeping such prices high so that they can collect unlimited funds? So that is a great question. Um, that is something that is actually under the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction. So we do work quite closely on. Um, we have uh, been in touch with the administration about it. Uh, we might be introducing a bill this Congress about it. We have introduced a bill already this Congress um, uh, concerning trial lawyers that are representing uh, veterans who have been, you know, impacted by drug in. use. There's got to be a cap. Yes. There's got to be something that says you can, you can't, you can't ask for the moon. Uh, somebody's uh, stubbed their toe. You can't ask for a billion dollars for that. You've got to put it into reality. Yeah. Bring no, it back. I understand. So that's, that, that is something that is under the judiciary committee's jurisdiction. And, and uh, we have been working closely on, and there hopefully will be, um, some type of legislation introduced this Congress to address that, but but we it is something we continue to talk to the administration about, and we do recognize it and agree that it's that is a that is a problem. And it's very interesting to me that you're under the Judiciary Committee, and thank you so much for your help in this regard and attendance at this seminar. I think you've been great. Thank you. Very Appreciate strong. it. I just want to ask one thing that Erica brought up. The Ads on television, at first, I, I didn't understand it. I, I wouldn't go to my doctor and said, I heard this ad and you have to give me this medication. Is it, does it pay off at all? Like, do patients do that? Oh, or, yes. Or, oh, yes. <laughs> um, let me just, it all pays off because patients want a drug that they think is popular. Um, I'll give you one example. There's a massive Adderall shortage in the country. And it's because if you ask anyone what, Adderall drug they can come up with. Back in my day, uh, it would have probably been Ritalin, but now it's Adderall. And well, so what happened was telehealth. Another expanded. reason too, because it yeah. keeps you thin, and there's a lot of women on shape. Yeah. So 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 Adderall has been massively overprescribed uh, during the pandemic. Um, there are some telehealth rules right now that make it so you don't even have to meet somebody in person the first time to get uh, prescribed that medication, and some of that is getting is getting rolled back, but it, it is, it, it is very, um, there's been studies that I've seen that do show that, uh, people will go to their doctors after seeing commercials and ask for that drug. And that's why the pharma industry is so intent on continuing to do that. But as Erica mentioned, there are only two countries in the world that do this. And it's very silly. In fact, we do a lot of stupid things as a country that only one other country does, including the debt ceiling. There's only one other country that has their debt ceiling tied to the percentage of the GDP. You know, like we shouldn't even have a debt ceiling, in my opinion. Um, but but we really shouldn't have a debt ceiling that's tied to the GDP because it just allows the uh, country to default. And uh, I think the other country is Denmark. It, it makes absolutely no sense that we're one of two countries that does silly things like this. So Erica made a great point and it is something we're trying to get rid of. Um, we're hoping they pass that back to the consumer. Um, hopefully as we work to um, regulate stock buybacks and other things, it would have to be pushed back to the consumer or at least to innovation. But um, you know, it is, it is something that we view as dramatically increasing um, prescription drug costs uh, and something that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be happening. Thank you. So I actually have a quick follow up on that because you did mention Adderall. And yes, totally has been overprescribed, I think, in large part 
probably due to the pandemic um, and everything that happened. But I was kind of concerned that I didn't hear kind of action plans or hear many elected officials talking about it because there are there it is an addictive you know addictive drug yeah but there are also people who need it who Definitely. suddenly didn't have access so, to it and that can be a, very dangerous so we uh i'm happy to share it with you um i'm not sure if i'm actually able to put something in the chat but if not i'm i can get your contact info or we can you well, can send it to if you send it to our office uh, right. uh, um so office. we recently uh led a letter with congresswoman velasquez uh to the fda um, asking them, uh, you know, what their action plan is on this issue. We have had conversations with HHS, uh, the agency that that oversees health, um, about this issue. Um, we very much wanted to react stronger. Unfortunately, what we've learned is there are not really any easy solutions on, on this issue. Uh, the drug manufacturers cannot keep pace with the prescriptions. And so the drug manufacturers would like us to make it easier for them to um, produce medication, but uh, really the ways that they think it can be easier for them to produce medication would increase uh, uh, safety risks. And so a lot of Democrats are not uh, keen on doing that. Um, there is a uh, uh, provision that was in one of the COVID bills that allows drugs like Adderall to be prescribed more easily uh, over telehealth. And there's there's two reasons why this has been um, causing the drug to be overprescribed to the, to the point where the drug manufacturers can't create it fast enough. One is that um, sometimes people will get denied if they go to a, uh, a doctor and ask for Adderall. It is possible they could have an anxiety disorder, they could have other a doctor could think there's other drugs that are that are beneficial, but via telehealth, you know, a lot of times people just ask for Adderall and they get Adderall. The other issue is that over telehealth, and, and I'm not talking about the reputable telehealth that goes through like medical systems. I'm talking about like some ad people see on social media or the, these other companies that like their sole business is to sell like a type of drug, essentially. Um, these companies will have someone meet for like some online consultation and they'll never talk to them again. So for instance, I used to take Adderall and it caused me to be too anxious. And so I switched to another medication, but these people don't have doctors that they talk to regularly and almost never switch off onto other medications. And so we, we do, you know, we are, we do want to support the FDA's efforts to uh, increasing the production of the drug but we also have to look at the way the drug's being prescribed. But we are we are working closely on it. It's just tough for us to tell people, you know, we need to make it so less of you are prescribed this drug, essentially. No, no, yeah. and I get that. I guess, yeah. I, and I mean, there's been countless like articles and everything about that over prescribing situation. I guess my frustration when I was reading about it is, you know, COVID has been so hard on our children in schools. Yeah. If you have ADD or ADHD and you've been, you know, prescribed this drug for a long time, not just since the recent telehealth, you know, um, changes came into play, that there was just not a an action plan for those specific individuals. But Definitely. I don't want to so, take up more time. But yeah, yeah, just 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 to the last thing I'll say very quickly is um, whether it's sending it to Barbara or sending it to you directly, we'll send you the letter. And then also we can follow up when HHS, or sorry, excuse me, when the FDA responds to the letter, which is hopefully soon. I believe that we're also going to have a briefing at some point with the FDA. And so we could possibly update you after that too. But we are, yeah, we'd love to be, we are, we are working on it. There are also a number of people in the office that take medi that medication. So I'm selfish, sure <laughs> selfishly, uh, we care. Thank you. Right, yeah. Um, before we go back to Erica, because Valerie hasn't spoken, um, let's unmute Valerie. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming, Allison and Andrew. Um, a couple of questions are not really related. The first has to do with the case in Amarillo, Texas, and the prescription of uh, abortion drugs. And um, what is the Judiciary Committee and the ranking member? Is there a plan to address this? 
Yes. Uh, so last Congress, um, we introduced and co-sponsored multiple bills to address this. Um, we have been working uh, more on the side of, of, of um, protecting people that uh, are penalized by states for trying to get these drugs. And we have sort of been um, uh, working to support uh, uh, female members of Congress, especially members of Congress uh, that are in the pro-choice caucus. Uh, Congressman Nadler is also a member, and especially members that are in the Democratic Women's Working Group. They have really been um, taking the lead on addressing this issue, but they use the Judiciary Committee uh, as their um, advisors in uh, drafting legislation, in uh, communicating with the administration. So we are uh, providing a lot of support for the members who are leading, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of addressing this issue. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of work uh, last Congress uh, for people um, that uh, were, were potentially looking at criminal charges as, as well, um, working with the Department of Justice. And we're going to continue to do that this Congress. Um, I, I would say it's it's one of our top top priorities. Um, the pro choice caucus uh, is um, you know a very strong caucus. We're working right with them right now on an amicus brief uh, for a lawsuit on this issue, uh, and um, you know it's it's something that we're we're constantly we're constantly working on, uh, and we're working on in close consultation with with. Uh, NARAL, Planned Parenthood, and and the other major stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Allison, did you have anything to add? Just because I know, um, yeah, no, okay. Well, I think she does, but she's not unmuted. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so related to that, um, you mentioned during your presentation um, how I I don't know. I don't think it was that long ago that you could go online and leave a comment for a member of a different district. And I noticed that that has changed. Um, I'm glad you mentioned it because I thought I was going crazy because I actually tried to, a very innocuous email to congratulate Hakeem Jeffries on him becoming the democratic leader. And because the drop down box, I wasn't in the district, I couldn't even leave that message. And so I'm passing that along to you guys. I mean, we should at least be able to contact another member or the Democratic leader. I, I, I find that to be rather odd. Yes. Um, so that has, every office uses um, constituent management programs. And uh, typically what offices would do before they sort of, tightened restrictions on asking for zip codes and things like that is they just wouldn't tell you they were essentially not going to look at your message. Uh, I do not think that's fair uh, necessarily, but I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if we would get any mail outside of uh, the district, we would forward that mail. And, and I'm not talking about mail from like uh, organizations or something. I'm just talking about con constituent outreach. We would forward that mail uh, to the appropriate office. So, um, you know, I would recommend in that instance, uh, calling Representative Jeffrey's office. I know that's frustrating. Um, we can also pass them a message uh, in, in our office. Well, I mean, it just, it just makes you use snail mail when um, everybody's trying to encourage you not to use snail mail. I mean, they can, they can push me off into yeah. a category at the end of the day and not read it. But to not even be able to send that email with ease seems like um, contrary to all the money and taxes we're paying to support, uh, you know, the entire congressional system. I, yeah. I mean, I just I just found that to be really yeah. outrageous. Yeah, I, I definitely um, understand. Um, I'll, I'll just say, I, you know, and I'll, I'll provide that feedback to the to the caucus as well. Um, two two things that I think led to that a little bit, but maybe they have tightened things too much is, is one, just the sheer number of, of correspondence. Um, you know, uh, we, we get tens of, of thousands uh, of messages a day. 
Um, and we can see the ones that are filtered out. And unfortunately, like 90% of them are, are like death threats um, oh. and really awful things um, that I will not repeat. And, and so um, it is worse for certain members. It's very bad for Representative Jeffries. Um, starting with impeachment, it became very bad for Representative Nadler. And so I think that is one uh, the I issue. Um, you know, I yeah, probably, no, I get it. I get know. there are pros and cons to it, but mm. I just think that there are ways to deal with it that, you know, I just felt, I felt like, wow, this is a really off-putting not even to be able to send a particular comment. When I remembered like less than a year and a half ago, being able to send something to Susan Collins. So, um, you know, um, okay, my last, my last question is this. So when the ACA was up and everybody was running on the ACA, even those people who didn't vote for it were, you know, who were saying how great it was, even though they never voted for it um, in their districts. In terms of the new healthcare issue, whatever, I mean, why can't it be that um, if it goes through and your member doesn't vote for it, your state doesn't get it? Well, I mean, I, I... I, I get the sentiment. Um, I think that would be negatively impacting a lot of people uh, in that district who, who badly or in that district or state who, who badly need uh, support. Um, there's a lot of gerrymandering, for instance, that's done in, in Texas. Like Austin, Texas is split between like six different congressional districts. So the people who live in Austin, Texas are, are generally you know, de Democrats and pretty liberal, but they're representative, represented almost entirely by by Republicans due to gerrymandering. So a lot of this is against their, um, you know, uh, wishes. But I, I do understand the settlement. It is but, it is very frustrating though when they take credit for things, um, which they do a lot, uh, especially for infrastructure uh, after voting for it. So I I definitely get it. Um, well, but I'm I'm just being, and then the other the other piece of that though is there could be some legislation where you have to affirmatively say whether you've actually voted for it or not if you if you're coming out, in terms of you know, just like a warning, uh, on, you know, the following states have not really did not support this or you know something that goes along with that in a pharmacy so people know. Um, what's happening and who's who's voting who's voting for these things and why they're getting done? Yeah, I I, I feel like Republicans would very much oppose that, um, but it's it's you know it's something we can look into. As far as um, getting messages, though, I I don't know how much I can help with with Senator Collins, but um, oh no no until, I, I said no no, no I, I just mean, want to I just want to yeah. say until things uh, do improve, and I will give your feedback uh, you know pass your feedback along if you need to ever reach out to. Uh, a Democrat's office, uh, you know, we're, we're no, happy. No, I appreciate that. I just, yeah. I just thought it was me. I, and I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I just think that that's, you know, that's pretty outrageous that you can't leave a message for somebody, yeah. but no, I um, definitely understand. Well, yeah. Well, um, good luck with the, um, with the FDA piece. I'd be interested to see how that moves along. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to bring that, up, that up, but, uh, Rebecca, anybody else? Also, I'm, I'm not sure, let's see, maybe I'm not allowed to send to everybody. I sent, uh, I tried to put the um, the ADHD Adderall letter in the chat, but I think I might've sent it as a direct message. So I will. Yeah, it is. And if you send it, if you send it to me, I'll send it to the office and then they put it on the website. Great, great, so great. We can, we can do that. That's the way that. we do awesome. it rather than. Um, another thing I. Send it to me as well. Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, Rebecca, is there somebody else? So let's go to Dawn, who hasn't spoken yet. Hi, thank you, Andrew and Alice. Um, really on. appreciate hearing all of the information. I handle health policy for Senator Kruger, so it's a real oh great to hear your perspective. We, we uh, very much uh, like your your climate uh, super fund bill, and uh, we are working to support it. And uh, we are hopeful to introduce uh, similar legislation in, in Congress in the next two or three months. So Fantastic. sorry, I, I know that's not, I went off task for a second, but uh, I'm a big fan of your boss. Oh, well, thank you so much. Likewise. Um, so I, regarding your boss, so um, just I wanted to share a couple of thoughts uh, uh, that that struck me while listening to to you. Um, one is, you know, it, it's funny with with the 
commercials that are playing all the time regarding medication. I'm just wondering, is there any way to tie MLR rates to or ratios to, um, you know, to the money that is spent on these commercials? And I don't know if, you know, if that is a possibility, would that be a state level action? Could it be, or, or could it just be a federal level? Um, related to that, and in general, I think, you know, just also interested to hear your thoughts on how the, you know, how we might collaborate potentially, you know, at the state and federal levels to work on issues with drug pricing. Um, I think there was one other, well, I'll stop there. Um, those were the, the two main things. Yeah, um, that is a very interesting proposal. Uh, I am not sure, but thankfully um, we have the Congressional Research Service, which is a think tank that uh, works for the United States Congress, as well as uh, committee staff uh, on the, the Ways and Means uh, Health Committee that, that may know the answer. Um, you know, uh, that is that could be an interesting proposal and we could look at, at it for possible uh, legislation. They would also... Uh, you know, be the ones to tell us if it was more at the uh, state or federal level. Um, I, you know what, my, my initial guess would be federal, but I'm not even 100% sure. So that, that would be a good thing. Oh, does Erica know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, happy to look into that. Um, as far as, as working together, um, you know, there, there are oftentimes we will weigh in with, with Governor Hochul, uh, we just signed on to a letter to the governor today um, that is being led by Representative Torres um, regarding uh, the decrease in funding for safety net hospitals in this year's uh, state budget. And so, you know, if there's ever any potential state actions or, or you know, any, anything we can do to, uh, you know, work together on that, or or if there's something you can do to help us at the federal level, we, we would love we would love to. To, to collaborate. Um, and I'm sure we'll be collaborating on that climate bill, with, but would very much love to collaborate on, on healthcare as well. I, I just have to say, Dawn, how many years have you heard me complaining about Medicare? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't take it. Poor Dawn had to put up with me quite a bit, right, Dawn? <laughs> Any other, uh, Rebecca? Yes, er I skipped over Erica okay. a couple Great. times to let yeah. new people speak, but we should unmute and, and then now. the last thing I'll say is, Don, um, Allison and my my life is going to be incredibly crazy until April first. But April after April first, maybe we can meet um, with our with our district office as well to to sort of see how we can we can best assist each other. So that that would be great, and and thank great. you. I I did just want to say that if there are also any ideas for strategies that we could use at the state level to help that haven't already been tried or you know, just whatever, that would love to, to brainstorm. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, let's definitely really, really anytime at April 1st, I am I'm so happy to meet. March 31st is our last uh, appropriations deadline. And so um, I'm not gonna be sleeping a lot until then, but after that, uh, I'm gonna, you know, hopefully continue to uh, meet everyone in, in the district uh, who uh, you know we haven't haven't met previously, so I'm I'm really excited about that. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So, Barbara, to answer your question before, if the ads didn't work, they wouldn't do them. I I, I became aware of that. I mean, it just um, happened the, to me though. The other thing, Don, is um, the list price was required to be included in commercials as of 2019. Hmm. I don't watch them because I have DVR and streaming for a reason um, because I don't, I just don't watch commercials. The only time I hear them anymore is if I'm working and I notice it's on in the background. So the next time it comes on, you might want to check because that, that was a requirement in 2019 that they fought and fought because that's not what anybody pays and it would confuse the public and yada, yada, yada. Um, so it's probably in the fine print along with the six day side effects, including death that could occur. Um, <laughs> so these, these things, part of the challenge now becomes in the U S why direct to consumer advertising for, um, 
for medicines is going to be an uphill challenge to get rid of is a little thing called Citizens United. Yeah. So this falls under free speech because corporations are since 2013 have been considered um, individuals. So they have they, they have fought this and will continue to fight it. They're also noticing that obviously most people are not watching um, broadcast TV. They've moved to streaming. So they're looking for ways currently to switch advertising. You know, you can't scroll through any app at this point without seeing digital advertising. I don't have as much of an issue with that as I do with TV because TV is a medium that it's pushed on you, whereas online you're presumably going to seek out information about your health care. Um, but the list price is already there since 2019, um, and it's going to be an uphill battle trying to get rid of it. I think there are other things that you know need need to come way above you know, on the list for healthcare, um, yeah. and to fight at this point. So thank you. You're welcome. Rebecca, if not, I have I don't a see, oh, no, Erica, uh, Erica just spoke, but yeah. I think if you have questions, okay, Barbara. just a couple of things. I think we covered so much with drugs, but I am going to go back to it. Medicare is a major issue. And I, I will say the doctors I go to, uh, those that take Medicare threaten not to take it. And uh, when I needed a new internist, it was impossible to find somebody that my doctor actually takes Medicare, but I have to give him $3,000 a year on top of it, which is a lot of money. Um, I have sympathy for the doctors. They talk about the fact that the Medicare in New York is just not enough. They, you know, it doesn't cover their bills to any decent degree. And I, I don't resent the doctors for it. What can we do to make places like New York, Connecticut, California, and so on, um, competitive enough that doctors will want to? It, it's not only that, it's also the, the amount of paperwork that they need. The fact yeah. that they have to sit in front of the computer, that they get penalized if they don't fill one thing out. Not only don't they get paid, but sometimes they get unpaid for something. Um, what can we do to streamline it? Is this a different, should we have a different committee meeting about this or? Um, um so, you know, we 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 obviously had a, a number of hospitals and um, community health centers in the district um, when it was New York 10. But uh, now that we have the east side and we have like NYU Langdon and Wow Cornell and, you know, uh, all these all these hospitals, uh, we, we've been meeting with them, uh, you know, constantly um, and the new community health centers um, since since the the new district uh, started on in, in January. And we have, this has been the number one thing that they've brought up, uh, this issue. So uh, Medicare needs a lot of improvements and New York, especially New York City is disproportionately impacted uh, by a lot of this due to the exorbitant, you know, cost of living um, here and, and, you know, just the healthcare costs in, in general here. And so uh, that's something we're, we're looking to uh, uh, address um, we've been in constant talks with um, the the mayor's office, uh, Governor Hochul's office, and, and uh, the um, you know the New York City city hospitals about that. Uh, we've also been hearing from uh, mental health care uh, professionals as well as neurologists because uh, we we've heard that people that meet with patients regularly are not adequately reimbursed. Um, and so that is a major problem where a lot of neurologists and, and psychologists and psychiatrists are not wanting to take Medicare because they are not getting uh, reimbursed. And so Medicare works a lot better for some doctor you see once every couple months and not someone you see regularly. And, and that is uh, something that needs to be changed, especially because our country has a mental health crisis that has been worsened with the pandemic. Um, and so uh, we very much need it so that mental health care, uh, uh, you know, treatment is, is affordable and people can uh, use Medicare to, uh, you know, to get that treatment. And so uh, we're looking at a number of things, um, but 
you know, this was on our minds last Congress, but it really, you know, skyrocketed to the top of our priorities once we started meeting with with every hospital in the in in the district um, and hearing this as as you know they have they have two major concerns that that's their number one and their second is uh, they just have just so many uh, you know uh, uh, job openings they're having such a hard time retaining uh staff. And, and so those are the two major, they, there's a big burnout of, of nurses, especially during the pandemic. And then, and then we need to drastically reform our visa um, uh, regulations so that we can keep more people, especially people that we train in the district to, we can, so we can keep them so they can stay in the United States and, and, and practice um, whether it's as a nurse or a, a doctor or, or any other, other healthcare professional. And so uh, those are the things that we're talking to the hospital uh, a lot about. And as, as far as, as, as visas, that's something we're working on directly because the judiciary committee, as far as the Medicare stuff, it's something that we're having conversations with the administration about and with uh, members on the ways and means. Um, I have uh, to say, I think yeah. it's internist as, as far as my experience has been. Um, I had a change internist and I would get recommendations from people. They don't, they can say they're taking uh, Medicare, but they wouldn't accept any new patients. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent a lot of time with it. And then if you do find somebody, there may be a wait of three months and I'm, I'm being literal about it. I mean, you may need somebody, you just can't get an appointment right away. It's been a horrible problem and uh, very costly. I just did my taxes. I can't believe how much my medical deduction will be. Um, you know, it's something to think about and insurance also. Um, maybe this will be another discussion about what to do. I, I, I it, it's been a discussion amongst older people between, as a, between drugs and Medicare and what doctor you're going to is not an uncommon conversation to have, uh, I will say. And people with insurance also. A lot of doctors are not taking any insurance at all. So yeah. we hear about pediatricians that are not taking insurance. I mean, this is, I don't know what I would have done. I have three kids. I don't know what I would have done if my doctors didn't take insurance. Yeah, it's 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 an awful situation. Um, I've, I've been dealing with a little bit of that myself, uh, but so many people are dealing with with worse and uh, you know, it's a lot of motivation to to work hard on this on this issue. Um, you know, I I originally uh, worked in in television in Los Angeles before I I transitioned into public policy, and a big reason for that was I got denied like six different times from health insurance before the Affordable Care Act from having concussions, and so uh, you know. Uh, it's always been a big passion of mine. Um, you know, every time I hear stories like this, it just reaffirms how how important it is and how how you know it gives me more gives me and I'm sure Allison more motivation to to work on this issue. But um, you know, it really is a top priority of ours. And I, I'm you know we we have a a, a strong voice in Congress. Congress and Allen a strong voice in Congress. We have a good relationship with the administration. Um, and with uh, former Congressman Javier Becerra, who's now the Secretary of, of HHS. And so we, we are hopeful that um, we can, you know, bring, continue to bring these messages um, to, to, to the administration and, and, and act on them in Congress. And it's always helpful when we have meetings like this where we can, you know, hear more because, you know, we, we heard it from the hospital side and, and we hear it individually from time to time from, from constituents, but this sort of forum is a, is a great way to hear more. Yeah, and I don't know if it can be done, if doing, if something can be done in a state or local level also, whether it's just federal. I was told that it's, it's basically federal. I, I think a lot of it is federal. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I really think that we need to um, uh, strengthen strengthen Medicare in, in a lot of ways. Um, and again, one of the reasons I think it's federal is because we're hearing about this from, from everybody. Um, we have actions planned this Congress. Uh, we are trying to get through appropriations first, which will, you know, impact some of this in appropriations. There is, there is um, funding requests and report language that we're submitting that addresses some of the stuff. But, you know, I, I think that after we get through appropriations on, on the 31st, um, we're going to redouble our efforts to 
to address these these issues. Uh, and you know, um, another thing that hasn't really been brought up is we're very concerned about Medicare Advantage. Um, we are co-sponsors of a bill to remove the word Medicare from Medicare Advantage. Uh, we are very concerned about people uh, not having any consent uh, with being moved off their plan to Medicare Advantage. Uh, that is something we are looking very closely at. Um, we are concerned with what New York City is doing um, on, on that issue. And so uh, it's it's a lot of moving parts, but um, maybe one thing we can do is, is um, give you updates periodically, um, meet every once in a while to, to give you more updates. If, if there's, uh, I, I know a lot of times we, I know we talk about prescription drugs a lot, but yeah. um, if there's something, you know, similar in the future, um, we also are going to have Allison uh, come up to the district because she's new in the office. And so maybe there'll be some forum where we can uh, do something in person, although it, it seems like you mostly do this remote right now, but yeah. um I would you know, like to be with we're, you. We're we're happy to to work on this, uh, you know, a lot. Um, Thank you. I'll wait till yeah. April first. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, <laughs> speaking speaking of April first, one, one thing I did want to add is that um, there is a uh, there is uh, something called community project funding requests that representatives can submit, and for Congress, for the House, I'm sorry, uh, they are due over the next two weeks. Now. The vast majority of them um, are going to be in uh, through a subcommittee called like the Transportation and Housing Subcommittee, and those submissions are due the 31st, so in 10 days. And so I know it's not a lot of time, and only 501c3s and government entities can can apply for these. But I, I put I I put a link to our request form, um, and I directed that towards I, I believe Barbara. And, and so what I wanted to say is if anyone knows of a uh, senior center, of a food bank, really any 501c3 that, that, that could use some funding, uh, we are happy to talk to them. You know, I know it's only 10 days. We've been doing outreach on our own and we, we have had some it. submissions. Right. But if you know anyone, um, you know, please have them apply. There's, there's guidance on our website. There's, an applica there's applications on our website. Um, I'm going to remove the deadlines, but the deadlines that are on there, they were Sunday, but they're, they were soft deadlines anyway, and I'll remove them tonight. Um, and also, I'm happy to answer questions. But, you okay. know, we, we have we have received a lot of requests for transportation projects from, from the mayor's office, and we care a lot about those projects, and, and we want to submit some of them. But uh, we have received less um, requests from, like, you know, uh, nonprofits than we normally do. One issue is that Republicans after they took control of the house made it so we can't submit any requests for healthcare facilities, which is very frustrating um, because that was something we've done a lot of in the past. We, we um, helped Brian uh, health open a new mental health center. Um, we, we did all these projects, um, but they have banned museums. They have banned healthcare centers. They have banned entertainment venues at a time where um, theaters, you know, especially, um, you know, uh, like uh, th theaters for plays are, are just struggling so, so immensely. So they've, Republicans have heavily restricted us, but we still have some options. And if you know of anyone, I know this is a shot in the dark, but if you know yeah, of anyone that could benefit, could offline, uh, I would, I would talk yeah, I'm, I am happy to uh, work my very hardest over the next 10 days to, to make it happen. I'm going to ask one other thing. We've talked mm -hmm. about one of the things the community board can do is pass resolutions that go through that would that be helpful? There seem to have been several things that we can push. Are there certain bills that we could vote on to see if we agree that would be helpful uh, if we did weigh in? Uh, yes, I think that could be helpful. I think that's another thing that we could get back to you on uh, a little bit, um, you know, with well, a little more information tonight, after the approach process likely. is over. Because uh, one thing we we started to do but we didn't really get answers back because i think everyone is really underwater on the hill right now is is really get a clear sense of what the ways and means and energy and commerce committees are, are doing um, we stand ready to support them we've already been um pushing them to do certain things but you know if we get a clear sense of of what their game plan is uh, what their strategy is and uh if there are any sort of marker bills being introduced um in the near future uh, those might be good things uh, to support with a with a resolution. 
And so, um, you know, we can we can certainly um, certainly look into that as, as soon as the appropriations process is over in 10 days. OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll meet as a committee and, yeah. and we, we may invite you back. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And Allison. Of course. And also, um, Allison is our healthcare staffer, but I cover uh, transportation, infrastructure, um, energy, environment, labor. Yeah, well, that would be so if there's anything ever those. regarding yes. those issues, um, yeah. you know, I, you hear of, I, hear, I hear a lot about people about, I hear a lot from people about helicopters, tours <laughs> of helicopters. So I'm, I'm in Washington, but I do come up a lot. And um, Allison is in New York. Al Allison's in Washington, D.C. as well. Oh, I see. Um, Hannah, who you've communicated with before, uh, is in is in the district. Um, she was hoping to be here tonight, but had another um, uh, okay. work work thing. Um, but generally speaking, when it comes to the policy, um, we do a lot of that um, in the D.C. office, okay. um, and the district office staff really helps us get a sense of of what we what we need to do for the for the constituents. But but when it comes to, you know, uh, le like Medicare and prescription drug pricing related legislation, that's that's really all okay. Allison and I. OK, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Wilma has her hand up and she's oh, been OK, muted. Rebecca. Yeah. 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 Well, um, uh, you should have received the prompts on your screen. While we're waiting, if you do care about helicopters, I'm basically at war with the FDA, FAA. Uh, <laughs> so we are we are working very <laughs> tirelessly on it. And we have FAA reauthorization um, happening in the Transportation Infrastructure Committee this Congress. Um, we have already introduced legislation addressing it. We've already written letters to the FAA. We're writing a letter to the mayor's office uh, the first week of April. Um, I've had countless meetings with the FAA, and we're hoping we get strong um, strong legislation added to the FAA reauthorization to finally bring some bring some peace to uh, New York residents. We also need the FAA to stop any more crazy stuff from happening. There, there's this company now that that wants you to be able to use a simulator, like a VR simulator for an hour or two, and then fly a what looks like a little helicopter around on your own with no other training. And, and like, you know, like it's it's Manhattan. You know, there's there's very few places to safely put that thing down, um, and and you know, so the FAA won't do anything about it. They won't do anything about seaplanes. So we're having lots and lots of issues, but we are we are working very closely on it. Um, we are we are talking with with Mayor Pete, and we're gonna we're gonna keep at it. Great. Yeah. Is Wilma um, unmuted? Not yet. Wilma, do you see the? It, she still has the prompt, uh, Kevin. Um, I, I I pressed the ask to unmute, but she hasn't responded. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> good. Miley, hi. Um, um, the program that we talking about about the the proposal for the five hundred one C three. I would like the information sent to me, Barbara. So I can give it to Stanley Isaacs because I think that there's a good uh, chance that they can um, uh, ask for that funding. That, I was wondering be, why you weren't raising your hand. <laughs> Raise for <a> wow. <laughs> that'd be fantastic. If, if, and if anyone has any questions, please email me. Um, and I am more than happy to more than happy to help. It's it's pretty much all I'm going to be doing for the next ten days. Well, I, Stanley Isaacs, I believe, is in uh, the congressman. Yes. Yeah. Is they will pull that out if I get the information. I will take it right to the Rodney. Rodney. Great. Great. Thank you. That's um, great. Also, add to stay safe out there. I don't know if this arrest is going to happen or not happen, but um, you know we are very concerned about uh, you know protests and and. Um, uh, potentially even violence around Trump Tower or, or other places in New York uh, City. Uh, we've been in communications with the NYPD. I've been having, I've been meeting with them once a day. 
Um, and, and so, you know, just again, I wanted to tell everyone to stay safe and, uh, especially if that, if that does in fact, uh, happen this week. Thank you. And also thank you so much for the information. It's been, it really yeah. been fun. But this has been so informative. You have been so great. We, we thank you very much. And I think we're going to be seeing you again. Yeah. But a lot of claps along the way. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it. Um, and this is, uh, really enjoyable for us too. Oh, uh, good. So you'll so come you. more often. Yeah, no. Maybe the, um, I would think about some time with maybe with Dawn also to see at a state and federal level to see if there's some discussion. Yeah, yeah. And Allison and I will will um, you know, and hopefully Hannah too will will um meet with Dawn right after we get done with the probes and we can uh see how we can we can help each other out. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I, I wanna thank you guys also, as we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, you're newly representing us, I guess, by, by proxy through yeah. Jerry Nadler. So we're very grateful that you took the time to come and speak Please with us. And all of the... That community board aid. Of course, um, you know, anything, anything we can do to help. Um, right. I'm also lucky that uh, Carolyn, Maloney, Carolyn Maloney's former legislative director, who's a close friend of mine, is Who's now uh, still working uh, on the Hill for, for Senator Van Hollen from Maryland. So uh, she's also been very helpful if I've had questions about community boards or if I've had questions about the East side. Um, she she always texts me back or calls me back. So I'm, I'm lucky to still have the um, support of the Maloney office as well. Um, she's doing great. She's doing such a lot of interesting things. So yes, definitely, good. definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, again, we're, we're always happy to help. Um, excited to to represent you i know congressman nadler is very excited to represent you and um you know again hopefully we'll be we'll be up in person soon from the from the dc office and hope to meet as many as you in, in person as we can at some point i met one of our fellow community board people for one we hugged each other we you know he wasn't this little box i saw him in real life <laughs> yeah it's been it's been really interesting you know i i was i was there on january 6th um, and then really after January 6th, uh, between that and the pandemic, uh, we, we really didn't have in-person meetings again until recently. And, and it's, uh, and now the, the halls of Congress are so crowded again, that's, it's, it's been kind of jarring to get used to it. Um, but I'm, I'm glad this, I'm glad this technology improved during the pandemic so we can, you know, meet with people in New York city when we're in DC in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, good way um but but do miss meeting people in person in, in a safe manner obviously and and so hopefully we can do that at some well, point we need to stay safe for many reasons so again thank you many, many reasons yes there's nothing else rebecca does anybody want to say we should adjourn and Ke I, I think we'd welcome Kevin also who worked so hard and will always i mean we have wonderful community board staff we appreciate it yeah yeah thank you so much um yeah. we appreciate it you, Allison. great Rebecca? We would welcome a motion to adjourn if someone wants to put their second. thumbs up. Or... I'll, I'll second it. <laughs> Perfect. Good night, everybody. You, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Thank, right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.